Our second reading today is Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, the majesty of your name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. You have taught children and nursing infants to give you praise. To silence your enemies who were seeking revenge. When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you have set in place, what are mortals that you should think of us, mere humans that you should care for us? For you made us only a little lower than God, and you crowned us with glory and honour. You put us in charge of everything you made, giving us authority over all things, the sheep and the cattle and all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and everything that swims the ocean currents. O Lord, our Lord, the majesty of your name fills the earth. This is the word of our Lord. I'd like to talk to you this morning about human dignity and about our creation vocation. A babysitter was enjoying time with her four-year-old grandson. They were talking about God and they were having a chat. And the little fellow said to his grandmother, I know where God lives. He said it rather proudly. And so Grandma was curious about what that meant. And so she said, oh, yes, and where, where is that? In the woods near your house, he replied. And then he jumped up and ran out to the next room and they, they got distracted and she wasn't able to uh, explore that more with him. And so when she got home, to her home, she spoke to her husband and she said what uh, the grandson had said. And he chuckled and he said, oh, I think I know what that meant. When he was here last time, we went for a walk in the woods. I told him that even though we can't see God, we can see his footprints in the things that he made. I pointed to the ground and I said, and I stopped on the ground and he said, oh, can you see my footprint on the ground? And the little fellow said, yeah, Grandpa. And then he said, well, the trees, the flowers, the river, the birds and the animals are God's footprints. You know he's here because you see them in the things he made. Isn't that interesting? The little fellow took it very literally that God lived in the woods near Grandma's place. Psalm 8 begins with those wonderful words. Oh Yahweh, the name of God is that. Wherever you see L-O-R-D in capital letters. Hello. Your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. Now who of you hasn't looked out at the vast creation and wondered about the nature of the God who made the stars and the sun and the moon and the planets and all the other things in the, in the sky? And I'm sure that maybe it's natural to wonder about our place as human beings within the immensity of God's creation. Yet this little brilliant psalm, Psalm 8, touches on these and some other really important issues about being human and being part of God's creation. And it does so with great style, this little hymn. In fact, C.S. Lewis called it an exquisite lyric. C.S. Lewis is good with words too, isn't he? And another commentator referred to it as creation set to music, and I'll explain that in a minute. Still another one said it was an unsurpassed hymn. That's a good idea too. In fact, in this, King David invites us to celebrate three things. And I'm going to concentrate on the third, so uh, we'll, we'll skip along from the first one and the second one. First one is God's majestic glory, verses 1, 2 and 9. God's greatness is vaster and more expansive than we can really imagine. In the words of Louis Giglio, it's indescribable. Has anyone ever seen Indescribable, the video? 
If you haven't seen it and you're able to watch YouTube, go to YouTube, find a video called Indescribable. It's about 20, maybe 30 minutes long, but it's got the most magnificent images. Um, Louis Giglio is very um, impacting as a speaker, and it's a really good video. And I, I suggest you have a look at it. It's called Indescribable. God's creation glory is so much greater than we can know. The Hubble Space Telescope has been placed in space a number of years ago, I think in the early 90s, to search the universe. It's able to send images back to us from space, much clearer than you can get from down here because of our atmosphere. And there are thousands and thousands of images have, that have been taken by the Hubble Space uh, Telescope over the years. And I just understand that last week they launched another one to take its place, an even better one. But here are some of the images. The first one. Now, what is that? Jupiter. Yes, yeah, some of you got it. Do you see the little red circle down the bottom? And see the little white one underneath it? Somewhere between those two is the size of the Earth, our planet. That's how big Jupiter is. Isn't that an amazing photograph? That red thing that goes round, you can see that if you have a telescope, and it's a really good one from Earth, you can see Jupiter. The next one is, what's that? That's a galaxy, off in the distance. And there's another one. They're wonderful pictures. And here are two pictures of possible black holes. See that little hole in the centre there? The Hubble Space, I think that's been coloured in, but the Hubble Space Station people think that that might be a black hole. And the next one that they think might be one as well. These are photographs from the Hubble Space Station. Then there are three that I think just magnificent. That was a photograph taken. And um, these are called rare, Lightsaber events. Look at that beautiful one. Out in space. Look at that one. Isn't that incredible? What's going on out there in space? Now, those are, who controlled the Hubble Space Station did an experiment a few years back. Astronomers were fascinated by a patch of the sky out there that seemed to be empty. From Earth, they couldn't see anything in this little patch of the sky. So they turned the Hubble telescope towards the so-called void in space and let it zoom in there for a, 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 a couple of days, actually. They put it there. Can you guess what they found? <coughs> 10,000 new galaxies. In that tiny little patch of space that we couldn't see anything in, 10,000 more new galaxies. Not just planets or stars. Galaxies. Each one of them contained billions of stars. No wonder David, when he was looking up as a shepherd one day, said, Oh Yahweh, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth and your glory is higher than the heavens. God created all that. I don't know why, but it's magnificent. So that's the first thing. We should be really celebrating God's magnificent creation. Secondly, there is great beauty and wonder in that creation. Using a acoustic astronomy, scientists, that is using sound, scientists have realized that space itself is not silent as we would imagine. It is four sounds. The planets and the stars that orbit around up there do so using pulses and waves that are very musical. They may not be heard by the human ear because they're at a different frequency, but they're there and they continue to emit sounds and sort of space music. And that's why that commentator said that Psalm 8 talks about the music of space. In verse 3, David says, I look at the night sky and I see the work of your fingers. The moon and the star you set in place. 
Then in verse 8 he goes on to say, talk about the flocks and the herds and all the wild animals, the birds of the sky, the fish of the sea, and everything that swims in the ocean currents. Now I want to show you some of the pictures of Israeli animals. There's the herds and the sheep. And there is a shepherd there with them. That would have been something near to where Bethlehem and Jerusalem were. This is in Israel, by the way. All of these pictures are taken of animals from Israel. Look at that one. They're sort of like African storks or something like that, but they were in one of the lakes in Israel. Next one. Did you know that there's a big, rather large wild cat in Israel? And there were wolves? This one looks like an Alsatian, but I'm assured that this is an Israeli wolf. Did you know that they had hyenas that were wild in Israel? Hyenas. And there's an onyx that out, that out in, the, in the wild wilderness places. And in fact, all of those animals in that slide live in Israel that King David would have known about. What about these ones? These ones are in Australia. What's that guy? He's an echidna. And that guy. Now imagine King David looking at an echidna and a koala. He would have said, God, isn't God amazing? And then there's this. Don't think they have that one in Israel, but we have that. And then this one, this one baffled scientists in, in England for many, many years. They thought there's no way that a a mammal could lay eggs, but that echidna and that platypus do. Now, that guy, well, he's just cuddly, isn't he? A wombat. And of course, one of the great symbols of Australia is the kangaroo. These are wonderful things that we can look at and say, isn't God marvellous in the creation of those wonderful animals? And so if we look carefully, we can stand amazed at God's genius in creation. And as God's good stewards, we have a role to play. <laughs> God didn't create anything without a purpose, but mosquitoes come close. The next one. <laughs> you know the old hymn, it's power of the blood. Well, even the mosquitoes know that. So, uh, I think that's pretty good. Okay. My third point is that human beings have a place of great dignity and vocation as God's image bearers. That's what verses 4 to 8 are about. Did you know that Academy Award winning director Steven Spielberg, as a young man, was touched very much by the movie Lawrence of Arabia? He was touched because of the vastness and the endless vistas of the Arabian desert. And I quote, I was inspired the first time I saw Lawrence. He said, it made me feel puny. That's one measure of its greatness. Perhaps King David was reflecting on his days as a shepherd when for many hours he might have lain on his back out there. That, that is a, a picture of a shepherd just outside of Bethlehem. That's uh, an actual photo from today, and that would have been just like David back three or four thousand years ago when David was a real. And uh, he was able to look up at the sky, the vastness of God's creation, and uh, the majestic array of everything. God's greatness and our feelings of insignificance are echoed, I guess, in Psalm 8, verse 43. David asks this question. Why don't we mere mortals that you should think about them? Human beings that you should care for them. But Jesus himself came into the world and he assures us that we are important. Listen to his words in John's, uh, Matthew 6. He says, Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth more than they are? Are you much more valuable than they are? And the answer, of course, in the Greek tells you. The answer is yes, you are. 
I want you to take that on board. Even though God created the 10,000 galaxies in that little bit of space out there, He actually thinks you're very important and that you're important enough to look after and care for. That's your dignity as a human being created by God. It's really important that we take that on board. But also, in that little word, those few words of Jesus, you'll notice that God cares for the birds as well. He wants them to be looked after. And so we have a role, and I want to talk about that quickly. Our dignity is also put alongside our vocation as human beings. Firstly then, within the bigger picture, what does it mean to be human being and have God's vocation for us? Psalm 8 tells us, and what it means is that we are part of a bigger worldview that includes us. We might call this God's creation project. Central to our role is what it means to be created in God's image and likeness. Did you know that you were created in God's image and likeness? God rules and we are to be his vice regent rulers. We are to reflect his glory and praise back into the rest of creation. Sadly, that project was tragically twisted by human arrogance and sin in the Garden of Eden. But the project itself of being God's image bearers in the world wasn't rescinded. We still have that role and purpose to be God's image bearers to the rest of creation. Verse 5 to 8 says, You made human beings only a little lower than yourself and crowned them with glory and honour. You gave them charge of everything you made. And so David reaffirms what Genesis 1 is saying. What a marvellous dignity and vocation God has given to us human beings. A couple of months ago, Lynn um, was strolling through uh, Facebook and you know the things on sale, the gum tree, and she found a beautiful big one by nearly two meter quality mirror. She bought it, and she intends to put it strategically in the sunniest part of our backyard, so that the sunlight can hit. Our backyard has. Big trees on the, the northwest. And so our backyard gets lots of morning sun and almost nothing from about midday onwards. And so there's parts of our backyard that are very shady and dark. And so Lynn had this bright idea. She would get this big, huge mirror and put it where the sun was all afternoon and it could go bang. Bang, like those mirrors there, and reflect into the shady parts, the dark parts of our garden that need the light. And so that's what she had intended to do. The idea is that the mirror reflects the sunlight to illuminate the shabby dark spots, to encourage them to dry out and grow. Did you know that's what God wants you to do? To shine His glory into the dark parts so that they can be illuminated with our God's light. That's what we are called upon to do. To be His image bearers in the world. To show what worship is about and to show what God's intention for the rest of creation is about. In a sense, that's what we human beings were created to do. As a mirror, shedding the bright light of God's wisdom and caring love into the darkest parts of the world. Humans were created to bring God's order and wonder and glory into the rest of creation. And to celebrate it as that guy is there. He's got a harvest that he's really celebrating. So when we human beings take up our divinely appointed role, looking after God's world on his behalf, and we were wisely using it without abusing it, we do what it means to be truly human. That's what it means. We don't, we're not observing God's role in doing that. We are doing it rather humbly and obediently 
carrying out our divinely created purpose. We care and we worship as human beings within his creation. But there's another role, and this happened after the fall. And this is God's people's vocation, that is for Israel and for the church. So alongside the creation vocation for all human beings, there is a very vital role that's sometimes missed by us. In the Bible, following the fall of Genesis 3, God not only called human beings to look after the creation, he called Israel and the church to do it especially so. It's part of his saving kingdom plan. So God called Abraham and Abraham's offspring, the people of Israel, to show what he would do in terms of rescuing the world. Adam messed it up. Abraham was called by God to reverse that. So God called Abraham to be fruitful and multiply, just as he called Adam to. And he offered him the new garden. What was the new garden called? Canaan. Aspiration when a person says that from the Old Testament. The promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, just like the Garden of Eden. It was going to be representative of what God's good intention for his land was to be. And the people of Israel were to look after the land as good stewards of it. And so they were called upon by God to be a holy nation and a light to the nations around about them. Israel was to reflect God's wise, loving, and now his saving rule into the world. Now sadly, Israel never really lived up to the divine calling. Their mission was undertaken by a people who themselves were in great and desperate need of mission to them. They needed rescuing as much as the rest of humanity. In fact, Israel kept biting the hand that fed them. But in that, they still remained Israel. And here's the good news. God's rescue plan was set in place in and through the key representative Israelite. Who was that? Jesus. Messiah Jesus stood up where Israel had failed. In his life, the wonderful caring way in which he looked after people and the, the environment. In his life, his death and his resurrection, he is the light of the world. God's plan was played out and won by Jesus. Every enemy was defeated. Every one of the Messiah's plans were put in place. Sin and death and Satan were overcome. And this, we pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The New Testament quotes Psalm 8 on a couple of occasions, and it talks about Jesus being the true human one, the Messiah. In Hebrews 2, it quotes verses 5 to 7, and then the writer of Hebrews says, All things are under their authority, that's human's authority, and he says in verses 8 to 10, what do we see? So, what do we see? We see Jesus, who for a little while was made a little lower than the angels, and because he suffered death for us, he now is crowned with glory and honor. So Jesus takes up what Psalm 8 meant for human beings, and he calls upon us, his followers, his body, his people, to do the same. Now we have problems with that because we've got caught up in Greek philosophy, not Hebrew philosophy. We Westerners have been caught up in Greek philosophy such as Epicureanism. Has anybody ever heard of that? The ancient Greeks had Epicureus and he was a guy that said, life is to be lived without worrying about the gods. Life is to be here, now, and you, to, you can enjoy it, you can live it, but there's a great gulf between us and the gods. They can stay up on Mount Olympus and be totally irrelevant to us. We're going to live now and enjoy now. Now I want to say to you that the large majority of Australians are a little bit like that. 
my whole family, my, my sisters and my brothers live that way. They don't, they're not out and out atheists. They actually agnostic. They say, well, there could be a God, I don't know. But basically, for them, God is irrelevant. He's sort of off there in heaven and um, doesn't intervene in their lives. And so their whole life is taken up on, well, uh, they're not selfish and that sort of thing, but their lives are taken up, as most Australians are, with living life here and now. So that, we call that Epicureanism. It's an ancient Greek philosophy. It's nothing at all like ancient uh, in, in the Old Testament of the Bible. To many Australians, if God, if he exists at all, he's almost irrelevant. And we, we Christians, have been shaped by another big problem. It's called Platonism, another Greek philosopher, in which this material world is considered to be a bit of a shabby place. We only endure this world as we have to. We want to get escaped from this world and go to be in a better world, a better place. And a better place is often considered to be a place purely of spirit, away from the second-rate material world. Now, I think that's completely wrong. Platonism has made us believe that the Christian view of heaven is non-material. And um, it's a devastating idea that's had impact on our own environment here in the world because it's a half-truth. Has anybody ever heard the saying, this world is not my home, I'm only visiting? If you get a chance, say to them, no, God has a new creation in mind. We're going to have a new earth one day in which righteousness will be and which we'll live as resurrected people. Heaven is not our home. The new creation is. It's a very, very bad half-truth to say that heaven is our home. The new heavens and the new earth are our final time in which we will live for eternity with God. And so when Jesus was talking to Pontius Pilate and he said to him, my kingdom is not of this world, he doesn't mean that it's of heaven. What he means is that uh, this, his kingdom is for this world, but it's not of the type of this world. It's not militaristic, it's not violent, it's not bullying like the Roman kingdoms were. This is a kingdom of wisdom and love, of forgiveness and self-sacrifice. It's a kingdom where the blind will see. It's a kingdom where the poor will be told the good news and so on. These are things that Jesus took as granted, but we think, when we listen to we think the ultimate goal for us is to get to heaven. But it's not. The ultimate goal for us as Christians is to live as his image bearers in this world here and now. And live out as what Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And then he said to his disciples, guess what? You're the light of the world and you're the salt of the earth. So really it's wrong to try and think about escaping from this. Yes, I know, if you look around the world, that vision of heaven is it's really a very poor one. I found that on the internet. Walk up into nothingness. But this world, of course, can be harsh and brutal. It can be very difficult to live in. And of course we want to go and be with Jesus. The Apostle Paul wanted that. And the thief on the cross wanted that. And Jesus promised, today you'll be with me in paradise. The paradise is the, not the ultimate, that's a place of rest. When Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, he meant a room that was temporary, like in, a, in an inn or a motel, getting ready for the new creation. So very emphatically, Jesus, when he says, the, uh, you know, my kingdom is not of this world, he doesn't mean of this world in the sense of it's of heaven, he means it's not type of this world, but it is definitely for this world. It's a kingdom of love and peace. It's a kingdom of justice. And it's about world renewal. 
And so Jesus calls his people, that's us, to live out his kingdom project in the world, being salt and light. For Christians, this means mission. It means mission into the world, locally, through the op shop and so on, as our church does. But it also means internationally. And we're going to hear from Uniting World, two Sundays time. And we're going to hear what the United Church is doing throughout the world, which is a really good project. So this is our God-given vocation, to be both stewards of the earth and praise givers or worshippers. And we are to declare and live out the love, the goodness and the loving rule of our God. And we are to do it prayerfully and humbly. Psalm 8 encourages us to do that. It encourages us to look at the wonderful things of creation and it invites us to then find our own place within it. On the one hand, it's the glorious combination of creation being fully alive, us included, celebrating the Creator. And on the other hand, of human society and the church being properly ordered through love, justice, peace and prosperity. Let's go to it as his people. Amen? Amen. Yes. Let me bow in prayer.